Well, we are concluding this week our series looking at the mission and the core values of our church. Of course, the mission of our church is loving people to life in Jesus Christ. And this week we're coming to the sixth of those core values, alive people worship Jesus. And to help us to think about this, we're going to read from Psalm 105. And uh, we'll be looking at actually the first eight verses and then jump down to verse 39 and read through the end of the psalm. So as, as you're able, I invite you to stand as we open God's word together with Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced, you his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. Then down to verse 39. He spread out a cloud as a covering and a fire to give light at night. They asked and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations and they fell heir to what others had toiled for that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. May God add his blessing to this, his word. You can be seated. Well, back at the end of June, Wilson and I spent a week in the mountains of Pennsylvania with his scout troop for summer camp. It was a really good week in just a beautiful setting. I really enjoyed doing scouts with my dad when I was a teenager, and it's a special joy to be able to do that again from a different perspective uh, with Wilson. One evening during that week, the camp held vespers in the outdoor chapel there. Now, it might sound odd to hear a pastor say this, but that was honestly just about my least favorite part of the week. And part of the reason for that was the reaction of most of the scouts, the moans that came when they were told that we were going to Vespers as a troop. It made me really grateful that our kids actually enjoy coming to church. But another reason I didn't particularly care for that, those sort of ecumenical services is that out of a desire to include everyone, they often will strip out pretty much everything of any meaning. It's kind of like the skim milk of worship. Going for the lowest common denominator doesn't usually make for a very meaningful worship experience. But the main thing that I disliked about that service was just the atmosphere. You know, there was no joy to it. One of the 12 points of the scout law is a scout is reverent. How that seemed to be defined at Vespers was that you had to be quiet and somber. You had to be sure not to smile or give any hint that you were enjoying yourself. And it was the responsibility of those who were leading to make it easy for you to do that. I just left there with my heart aching for those scouts in our troop who don't know Jesus. Because if that's what they think worshiping God means, it's no wonder that so many people in our culture, especially young people, have just checked out of church. It hurts because I know that worship can be so much more. We are all built to worship. All of us will worship something. If God doesn't have that place, something else is going to take it. All you have to do is to look at our stadiums and our televisions, our theaters and our cell phones, 
Amazon and Instagram, Washington and Hollywood, whether we worship a sports team or a politician or an actress or ourselves, we all worship something. But if that something isn't God, it's something created, something that's flawed, and there's no way that it can hold the weight of our worship. So as we look at Psalm 105 today, I'd just like us to ask two simple questions. At least they seem simple. How should we worship God? And why should we worship God? I think that psalm gives us an answer to these questions. And I think one of the reasons we can have trouble understanding how we should worship God is because our language hinders us. How well we can express an idea is shaped by the words that we have to explain it. You've probably heard that there are 50 Eskimo words for snow, and I don't think that's exactly true, but languages do expand our vocabulary to describe things that are relevant within each particular culture. For example, when we were in China, we picked up an expression in Mandarin, Tai Ma Fan La. It means too much trouble, but with the sense of a process that has been all messed up by the hoops and red tape of bureaucracy. When you want to move a class from a room that's too small and doesn't have electricity into the larger room right next door, but doing that requires visiting three offices, filling out four forms in triplicate, and getting eight different stamps on the forms, and then taking the dean out to lunch, that's taimafamba. It's appropriate that a society with 4,000 years of nearly continuous bureaucracy would at least come up with a shorthand for talking about it. In English, we have just a few words for talking about praise and worship and thanksgiving. Ancient Hebrew had more than a dozen. And when we try to answer how should we worship, we can learn a lot by looking back to our ancestors in the faith. And the first few verses of Psalm 105 actually give us a picture of this with the words that the psalmist uses. So I'd like to do a little bit of a word study today, dive into some of these to help us understand what it says about how we should worship God. The psalm begins with saying, give praise to the Lord. And that opening word is the Hebrew yada. It comes from a root meaning use the hand, meaning to throw a stone. But it came to apply to that gesture, lifting the hands in worship. It wasn't something that anybody did in the Presbyterian church that I grew up in. Uh, we took very seriously our calling as the frozen chosen. But that's how Psalm 105 begins. In fact, all of verse one is about reaching out. Proclaim his name, call on God, reach out to him. Make known among the nations what he has done. Make known is the Hebrew yada. In the poetry of the Psalm, it's the same sound but a different spelling and different meaning than the opening word. It refers to knowing something experientially, including in the biblical sense. But our worship should reach out. We should involve our body in worship by reaching out to God with our hands and with our voices. We also see that our worship isn't supposed to be just personal and private. Our worship is supposed to be corporate, helping us reach out to one another, reach out to others, so that they too can experience our God and his faithfulness. Well then verse two includes three different verbs around the same theme. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Those first two phrases include not only the idea of singing, as our English translations include, but also uh, playing stringed instruments 
just as Robbie was doing earlier. Tell involves a thoughtful conversation. The idea is that we should praise God with music as a conversation together. One thing we don't really know about Psalm 105 is what it sounded like originally. I'd be willing to bet that if we could hear it sung by those ancient Hebrews, that it would sound very, very strange to our ears. In fact, most of us are at best familiar with music of the church from the past 500 years or so. But the church is 2,000 years old. To say nothing of the history of Jewish worship before that, relatively speaking, even our oldest hymns are contemporary music. And just like music today, most of those songs of the past drew from the popular styles and harmonies of their own day to make them easier for people to sing, to tell of God's wondrous works in their own generation. I have a friend who's actually my dad's age, who was at Wheaton College in the late 1950s. She told me once that she doesn't particularly care for a lot of contemporary Christian music. The sound just isn't her jam. That's not the way she phrased it, but you get the idea. But she recognized that the very songs that she didn't care for were an answer to her prayers of 65 years ago. At that time, people at Wheaton and many other Christian colleges began to realize that there was very little new that was being written in Christian music. Most of the songs that were sung in church at that time were at least 30 or 40 or 150 years old. So they began to pray and to develop programs to prepare students to go out and write new songs for new generations. And it happened. People began to write new songs praising God across many different genres, and they're still being written today. The challenge for many of us is that in many things, especially in music, we often get set at a certain point. And as we get older, new things begin to seem more and more foreign to us. I think I'm already there for the way that I dress. Actually, I was probably there about 10 years ago, but I grew up singing hymns. And so many of them are spiritual comfort food for me. And I often have to make a conscious effort to learn and appreciate what is new. It's not always comfortable but often it's rewarding. It helps me in thinking about this to consider what music will be like in eternity. In Revelation 15, we see the conquering saints of the church standing with harps in their hands, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. You know, the first song in the Bible, near as I can tell, is the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. It celebrates the same events of the Exodus that Psalm 105 does. It's an old standard. You don't get more classic than the song of Moses. But the song that we have listed right after this in Revelation 15 draws from the themes of Moses' breakout hit in Exodus 15, his second album in Deuteronomy 32, but it's not identical. It's an adaptation. The way that many of our hymns adapt the Psalms or composers today set some of those same hymns to different harmonies. And when we look elsewhere in Revelation, we see songs that are completely new. At the worship night last Sunday at North Olmsted, I read from Revelation chapter five and the new song that the elders and the living creatures sang to Jesus. Music in eternity will be old and new and the old made new. It will include music from every tribe and tongue and nation. Worship makes us part of an eternal conversation of praise across time and place. 
And I think one of the signs that we are still growing in our faith is an ability to see this life as a rehearsal for eternity. When we will be forever celebrating with familiar songs and forever looking for new ways to praise our Lord. So our worship should reach out and our worship should enter that conversation of praise. And then we're told in verse three, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That word for rejoice contains the sense of brighten up. Our worship should brighten up our hearts. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, I shared that the ancient Jewish concept of the heart wasn't just referring to our feelings. It was our will and the very core of our being. Our worship should involve emotion, but it should also be intentional. Our worship should be an encouragement to us corporately. And Psalm 105 continues this idea of seeking the Lord in verse four. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. The expression look to means to follow. Our worship should help us seek God and it needs to be ongoing. It should help us to follow him. At the end of Psalm 105, the psalmist recalls that the purpose of God's deliverance of Israel was to enable them to keep his precepts and observe his laws. Our worship should strengthen us to follow him and to continue that ongoing process of growing in him. How should we worship God? Well, we should reach out. We should enter that conversation of praise. Our worship should be an intentional encouragement to one another and should help us to follow God. But you might have noticed I skipped a verb in verse three because that word also appears at the very end of the psalm. Glory in his holy name and praise the Lord. That verb is the Hebrew in both cases, the Hebrew halal. And the last phrase of the psalm is hallelujah, praise Yahweh. Halal carries an interesting range of meanings. It can mean to flash brightly, to boast in praise, or even to be a fool or a madman. Halal is the exact opposite of that Vesper service. It's the flash of exuberant worship, boasting in the Lord, letting go to worship with abandon. This is David stripping off his royal robes to dance before the ark of God in a linen tunic, even though his own wife thought that he was a fool. Of course, that's maybe not all that strange, but. This is the lame man grabbing Peter's hand and leaping for joy in the temple. This is worship that is completely unself-conscious, worship that takes us outside ourselves and is just overcome with praise for God. Now, it might surprise you, probably not, but halal isn't something that comes very naturally to me. My introvert nature makes me very self-conscious. And especially in the past, I found that it was really hard just to get outside my own head and actually worship. What started to change that was actually our time at the Spanish language church in Kentucky that I've mentioned before. We attended that church for about five years. And by the end of that time, with the help of a bilingual Bible and one semester of Spanish, I got so I could actually muddle my way through about two thirds of listening to about two thirds of a sermon before my brain melted. And I'm sure that's how many of you feel whenever I'm up here. But one of the things that was most meaningful to me about that church was our time of singing. Some of our songs were translated versions of hymns and worship songs I knew in English. Some of them were new to me original compositions in Spanish. 
I could pronounce the words that were up on the screen, and I love Spanish for that, that you can read it even if you don't know what you're reading. But I didn't awfully often know exactly what every word meant. And at first, that bothered me. I wasn't sure if I wanted to sing something I didn't understand. But the Holy Spirit worked on me. Over time, he said to me, you know, it's okay. Let go. Trust me. So as I learned the melodies, I just began to sing. And I discovered that I met the Spirit in such a powerful way, even though I only had a general sense of what I was singing. Open up the windows of heaven. Lord, move the mountain. I suppose that was the closest I've ever come to speaking in tongues. But I trusted the Spirit. And I trusted the people who had chosen the songs that I wasn't singing heresy. But that experience helped me to take my overthinking out of the equation, to get myself out of the way and just worship God. Now, I wouldn't want to do that all the time. It's good to understand what we sing. But ever since that time, I found that my worship is freer and more genuine. I still fight my self-consciousness but I will lift my hands in worship of my Savior. I can sing a new song to him. I can let go and trust him, and I can make it all about him, not about me. How should we worship? Our worship should reach out to God and to others. It should take us into an eternal conversation of praise. It should be intentional, encouraging us to seek and to follow him. And our worship should show that he is worthy of worshiping with abandon. But why? Why should we worship him? Well, the rest of Psalm 105 gives us an answer to that question. It's simple, but all-encompassing at the same time. We should worship him because of what he has done. We should worship him because of what he is doing. And we should worship him because of what he will do. Psalm 105 is known as a historical psalm because of the way it recounts Israel's history from Abraham through to Joshua. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. And we should worship God because of what he has done. We should remember his faithfulness to past generations. We should celebrate the faithfulness of those who came before us, those who helped to lead us to God. And we should worship God by remembering his grace. Referring to Israel's time in the wilderness, the psalmist writes, they asked and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert. Powerful words of God's provision. But did you notice something about those events? They aren't exactly times that reflected well on Israel. God provided quail after Israel grumbled about the lack of meat in the wilderness. He gave them manna, and they whined about it. He gave them water from the rock when they complained about their thirst and doubted God. They're all times that Israel failed, when Israel was faithless, but God was faithful. He showed them grace. And God has shown us grace, hasn't he? Paul tells Titus, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. In his grace, he saved us. The psalm remembers God's rescue of Israel. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. 
And today we can celebrate his saving work for us on the cross. As Paul writes in Romans 5, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We need to remember what God has done. We need to celebrate what he is doing. It stands out to me that the historical section of this psalm begins in the present tense. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is our God. It's not just that he was the God of our fathers. Just as his presence was with Israel in the cloud by day and the fire by night, he is with us today. And we need to have our own direct relationship with him as our heavenly father. As Jesus told us in the Great Commission, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As we saw earlier, our worship should help us to draw into his presence, to seek him and to follow him. This isn't a one and done, get saved and get on with life. It's a present journey, day by day, laying down our lives, taking up our cross, and following him. Worship should help us to celebrate that he is with us in all things. Worship needs to be a present and ongoing way of life. We should worship God because of what he has has done, his faithfulness, his grace, his salvation. We should worship God because of what he is doing. He is with us and worship should help us to set ourselves aside and follow him day by day. And finally, we should worship God because of what he will do. This summer, our youth director, Adrian Nolan, worked through seven Hebrew words of praise with our teens on Wednesday nights. And I asked Wilson one evening after youth group what they had talked about that night. And he said they had talked about the word tauda. Wilson, what did that mean? <clears throat> yes, we should praise God for things we haven't yet received. Now that word isn't in Psalm 105, but the idea is there between the lines. In fact, I think the prophet Jeremiah may have been thinking of this psalm when he received this word from God. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. Psalm 105 remembered the inheritance of the land that God had given to Israel. In Jeremiah's day, enemy armies were coming against that land. And Jeremiah had a very unpopular message that the people of Judah were about to be punished for their sin and sent into exile. But they were told that they would give thanks for a deliverance they had yet to receive for an inheritance that they had yet to claim. The Apostle Peter reminds us that we have an inheritance as well. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Already, and not yet. We have it, but we await its full completion. The inheritance is ours. We just have to wait for it. Verse eight of Psalm 105 proclaims, 
He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made to Abraham for a thousand generations. You know, Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago. That seems like a very long time to us, because it is. But do you realize that you and I are only about 150 generations from Abraham? A thousand generations is an incredibly long time. Probably 250 to 300,000 years. It might as well be forever. And that's the point. Because even then, God will remember and God will save. The final lines of the hymn Amazing Grace declare, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So let's give thanks for what we have yet to receive. Let's praise God for what he will do. How should we worship God? By reaching out in faith, entering into the community of praise, joyfully singing songs old and new to his glory, seeking and following him with joy and with utter abandon. We can't worship like that if we don't know why. We can't worship like that if we don't know him. We can only worship like that when we remember what he has done, his wonders to past generations and his saving grace in our own lives. We can only worship like that when we know the work that he is doing in our lives today, celebrating that he is that present reality, our ever-present help in time of need our counselor and advocate shaping us into the likeness of Christ. And we can only worship like that when we have that confident hope that Jesus is coming back to give us that glorious inheritance. So let's rehearse for eternity because alive people worship Jesus.